Are you ready guys? This is a meaty video. This is a highly, highly requested video. I'm so glad I'm finally making it. So I've been shooting on film since 2018. I'll show some examples now of what those original photos looked like. And then I'll show a few as well of some of my favourite photos that I've taken over the course of taking film photos. I'm still a beginner and I only shoot on point and shoots. So if you're looking for something a bit more advanced, maybe you're looking to look into medium format, I'm not the girl for that. I'm talking beginners of beginners. I'm getting you away from the disposable camera and into 35mm film that's just point and shoot. A beginner's guide to point and shoot film. This is gonna cover everything, every basic I hope, and give you some information on how you can get started as well. So before I made the video, I put out just a ask me any questions thing on Instagram stories, and I got a lot of questions about the expense of shooting film. And so I just wanted to do a quick disclaimer and say that film is a hobby for me. I find it fun, you know? <laughs> I'm happy to invest a bit of extra money in it. So I see it as a hobby. I would say roughly I spend about 20 pounds per roll of film and de with developing involved. So that ends up being about 20 pounds a month, which I think is a fine investment for a hobby. You see people going and playing golf, and, you know, they have to pay money to go to their sporting area, sporting area, where do you go to play golf? Why did I use golf as an example? Or people will pay for art supplies or how people who love music will pay to go to a gig. I don't think it's meant to be free. And so if you're looking for something that is free, I'd recommend this app called Dispo, which I'll link below, but basically you can shoot off film like photos and they develop the next day so you can only have access to them I think it's 24 hours later. That is a great alternative if you aren't in a place where you can invest any money. And I also had a few questions on the predictability of film and how you negotiate the fact that it's expensive with the fact it's not very predictable and that's part of the charm. <laughs> that's kind of like part of the experience of shooting film and you do adjust to it fast and you also do improve you stop getting dud rolls after a little while. So yeah, I just wanted to pop those two things out there in case you are thinking of going into the comments and being like, this costs so much money. I'm gonna do my absolute best to give you some affordable ways to shoot film. I hope it helps you. I'm sorry if it's not in your budget. Anyway, disclaimers out of the way. Hi, my name is Lucy, if you're new here. I talk about, well, this little platform is basically my online journal. I live in London. I take film photos on my Instagram. You can see those over there. And I just have a nice old time. Um, if you'd like to subscribe, please do. It'd be lovely to have you. And if you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button. Right, okay, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this. So what is a point and shoot camera? A point and shoot camera is exactly what it sounds like. You point your camera at what you want to take a photo of, and then you take the photo, you shoot it. They're the easiest to use. They function very similarly to a disposable camera if you've ever used one of those and they are some of the most affordable as well. They work like a disposable camera, but they are reusable. And they're designed to be simple to use. They typically have a fixed focus lens, which means that you're better off at a slight distance from what you want to shoot. If you hold something kind of like here-ish, I'm imagining this is the camera, you probably won't get a photo that's in focus. It generally works for a distance like me and my camera or even further. By my camera, sorry, I mean the camera I'm filming on. <laughs> I don't just mean I have like some extra camera. And some of the newer cameras have additional features. So for example, my Contax T2 has autofocus, which is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Pretty much everything ends up in focus and sometimes I get those nice little blurry bits around the background. And the blurry bits are called depth of field. So yeah, some of the newer cameras have these extra features. Pretty much all point and shoots have flash, but check it works before you buy. Hopefully whoever's selling the camera will say, because in any low light at all, you nearly always need to use flash. On most of these cameras, it should go off automatically when it knows there's not enough light. Film performs worse in low light than you would expect. We have got very used to digital cameras and light compensation on our phones, and you don't realize until you're shooting on film just how much light you need to be able to take a good photo. And some point and shoots have even more features, especially the ones from like the later 90s. I know some have zoom features. I'd quite like to get a zoom camera next, to be honest. So what is 35 millimeter film? 35 millimeter film is a type of film that fits into point and shoot cameras and many other kinds of analog camera as well. 35 millimeter film comes in usually a few different kinds of exposures and exposures is the number of photos you'll get. So generally I end up getting ones which either have 24 exposures or 36 exposures, but I've seen some that give 27 exposures. But yeah, generally I opt for 36 exposures because I feel like you're getting more value for money. So the ISO number on the film box is in reference to its low light capabilities. So ISO 200 doesn't perform very well in low light. It's meant to be used outdoors or usually in summer in relatively bright light 
or for me personally, I like to use it at night time as well when there's flash because often point and shoot cameras have a really bright flash. And so ISO 200 film means that it doesn't wash out everyone I take a photo of. And then I use ISO 400 film. Generally, it, it has a bit more light compensation, so it's better in autumn or indoors. Yeah, I, I definitely opt for ISO 400 film in most environments. And then some people enjoy using ISO 800 film in winter and when it's a lot darker, uh, low light shots or maybe even nighttime shots. However, the higher up you go on the ISO number, the more grain you get in your photos. So you do have to make that trade off. To be completely honest, I've never noticed much of a difference between ISO 200 and ISO 400 in terms of grain. I wouldn't worry too much about it when you first start off, just if you're maybe going up to 800 in the winter. So now to my preferences when it comes to film. I tend to use Color Plus 200, which is, I believe, Kodak, um, just in the general summertime, big outdoors, like festivals. It's also one of the most affordable films. So yeah, I, I end up using Color Plus 200 quite often, especially in summer. And then basically as soon as it turns into the muggy, cold, overcast English autumn, I'm straight on to Portrait 400. I love that film. It brings out skin tones really nicely. But I also, my boyfriend really loves Ultramax 400, which I think is also a Kodak film. And that makes everything look really bright, really poppy. But yeah, in general, I'm a Portrait 400 girl. And as I mentioned before, in the evenings, if I know basically I'm just using flash, I'll put a Color Plus 200 in because one, it's not too expensive. Two, I generally get 24 exposures, which is perfect for an evening or like a night out. And three, it doesn't wash everyone out when you do the the flash, good words. So I kind of touched on this just now, but film varies in price. Your cheaper films tend to be black and white films and the lower ISO films, so generally ISO 200. So you can buy film from a few places, Amazon stocks a few films. I usually end up buying from small businesses though, either online or in person, because generally the prices aren't much cheaper on Amazon and obviously I'd much rather support a smaller business. So it's definitely worth going to if you have a local developer or like camera store in your town or your city, definitely go there and check it out or maybe order online. It always feels like such a huge hit when you buy film because you generally have to buy in packs of like three or five or seven. And it's always kind of like, oh, that's a lot of money. But then when you break it down and realize how often you're actually using the rolls, it does work out at a much cheaper rate. Let's talk about finding a camera. This was by far the question I got the most was how on earth do I find a camera? What do I do? So my sustainable friends will be pleased to know that every camera is secondhand. No one makes point and shoot cameras anymore. So you're always buying secondhand. I have two point and shoot cameras. I have an Olympus AF-10, which I bought for I think 40 or 60 pounds. And then I have a Contax T2, which was a big treat for me. That is an expensive point and shoot because uh, like a few people made it very popular and it's one of the best ones on the market. So I bought both on Depop from a trusted seller called Retro Camera Shop. There are a whole host of really trusted sellers on eBay and Depop and I'm sure other resale sites as well. Etsy I know have some but I just tend to use Retro Camera Shop. I'm so sorry, that's my dishwasher going right now. <laughs> I've used Retro Camera Shop because they give you all the information you need on their site. They check all the cameras before they sell them and make sure they're in good nick, and then they tell you which battery you will need for it, uh, what it kind of shoots well, where it's best, and show you some like example photos. They're really good. I would really recommend them personally. I'm gonna go shut the door because you don't need to hear my washing machine. <laughs> but yeah, as I said, you should definitely have a browse on eBay, Depop and Etsy and just see what you find. I would say for your first point and shoot, you can spend anything up to a hundred pounds. I wouldn't recommend spending less than 15 pounds. I've had a friend who bought a camera for a tenner on eBay and it just basically fell apart as she used it. The flash didn't work, the front would fall off, she'd accidentally exposed the film to light, which is something I'll talk about in a bit, but it would just ruin the entire roll. Yeah, I would definitely opt for spending maybe between 20 and 40 or 20 and 60 and looking for something that's been checked through and you know what you need with it, or if there's any like, uh, faults, like um, manufacturing faults. That's something <laughs> that I was not told, but if your camera breaks, Google it because it might be a manufacturing fault. These are obviously analog cameras. They were built at a time where stuff did break. Um, my contact sometimes needs to have the battery removed and put back in again. When you use the flash one too many times, it just jams and freaks out. And I didn't know that was a thing. But yeah, a quick Google of what was going on and I got some answers. So yeah, hopefully if they're a seller that knows that onions, they will have a little bit of information about what battery you need to use it with and any known quirks or faults of the make or the model, 
or just any other information you might need about the camera. And if they don't, maybe drop them a message and just see if they've got anything else to add. So for me personally, I would generally opt for a camera reseller while it might increase the price slightly. I feel it's more trusted and someone's actually checked that the camera works. Whereas with, you know, if you wanna go slightly cheaper, definitely go on eBay and like have a browse and see what you find. You can find a steal, so I'm not gonna stop you. So now I know this is a question that I definitely had when I started, how to load your film. I'm gonna cut to future Lucy, who's gonna give you a little demonstration of how to load your film camera. Hey friends, so I have just finished a roll. It is rewound, so I'm going to look for the opening and pop it open. There we go. I'll take the cartridge out and pop it in my canister. So as you can see, I've pushed this latch here to open the back of the camera. And then I have my film cartridge here. I take it out of the canister and I slide it into this hole here. And then I tend to push this along slightly. You can usually see somewhere around here where the film is meant to catch in these holes, um, but rarely do I fully line it up. And so I get it in, I push enough of it through that hopefully the camera should be able to sort itself out basically. And then I put the back on. It will make this noise for a little while and then it stops and you might be able to see, oh, if I can get it in focus, that the number on the top just says two. So it's like oh, one or two is ready to start working. Normally mine goes back to two and then round through to like 36 or whatever my number of exposures is. And then yeah, I shut the lens because I don't wanna waste the battery and we are all ready to go. As you can see in here, a lot of them have a little window. So mine is portrait 436 exposures ready to go whenever I wanna use it. Okay, and we're back to me, hello. So once you've shot all the photos on your roll of film, most cameras know to roll the film back automatically into the cartridge. You will hear this happen, it is a loud process. However, some older models do have a manual winding handle or a button to press. Definitely check with your camera seller or go online and see if you can find an old manual. And some are really helpful, they come with a little button you can press if the automatic winding feature fails, which is super helpful. Whatever you do, if you find that your camera is not winding back and you don't know why, do not open the back of your camera. As soon as you expose that exposed film to light, it just wipes the entire thing. So it's just not worth it. I would take it into a family friend or a camera shop locally and they should be able to help you and help get it wound back into the into the spot. If you absolutely have to open the back of your camera, please do it in total darkness. Once the film has rewound, you take out the cartridge and pop it in your canister. Don't worry too much about light exposure from that point on, just maybe don't leave it in direct sunlight. And then yeah, pop it in your bag and pop it to the developers. So let's talk about developing film. I'm gonna talk more specifically about developing film in the UK. However, I know that there is a big Reddit database, although there weren't a few of the camera shops that I know of in London on the database on Reddit. So do check, it's a worldwide database. It might just need a bit of updating, but there might be one local to you. So wherever you are in the world, check that out. I will link that below. So there are some options for getting film developed in the UK. On the high street, I know Snappy Snaps, Boots, and some Asdas do it. However, they can be so expensive and that often the practices are kind of outdated, like they'll, send you the photos on a CD, <laughs> which just seems so unnecessary now. We live in a world of WeTransfer. Yeah, they're just often quite expensive as well. My friend says she paid 25 pounds recently for a roll of film to get developed at Snappy Snaps, which is outrageous. So there are also local stores in quite a few towns and cities in London that do it a lot more affordably. I go to Eye Culture and Bethnal Green. They are so good. They are prompt, they're amazing. Yeah, I love them. They're super professional. Would recommend them to everyone and anyone, especially if you're in East London. So they offer different services for different prices. I tend to go for high definition photos and I get them processed for the next day. And then I also just get a wee transfer. I tend to not get prints. I just collect my negatives at the end, like whenever I'm walking past. So that means that I take my film into Eye Culture. I give them the information they need. I pay while I'm in there. And then overnight, like by like kind of like 2 p.m. the next day, my prints arrive by email. So I have looked at what the cost would be for me to scan in my own negatives, but the machines that do it well tend to be like 200 quid. I actually don't think I'd save any money in the long term doing that. So for all of those services, I pay 11.99, which I think is really good value, especially for the high quality and the next day processing. I think that's super good value. So there are shops like that across the country that offer really affordable film processing, and I would always recommend supporting them if you live local to one. However, as it is, lots of people don't live close to a film processing shop. 
So I have you somewhat covered. You can post your film to a film processor. In lockdown, I sent my rolls off to AG Labs in Birmingham and they were great, they were swift, they were really good and they offered a really great pricing structure on their site. You knew what you were gonna pay for as soon as it arrived and they would WeTransfer the photos. I would really recommend them. I also believe Asda offers a postal service as well, definitely worth checking that out. But yeah, there's a whole host of film developers who accept rolls by post. Definitely, definitely give it a Google. Again, look at some of the resources I leave in the description and see if there's one that kind of fits your price range, fits your criteria, and is maybe like slightly closer to you. In general, I would say don't spend more than 16 pounds per roll when developing your photos and getting prints. And don't spend more than 10 pounds if you're not getting prints. Obviously, it'd be more expensive if you're looking for high definition, if you're talking about, you know, next day stuff. But in general, if you're doing a week's turnaround standard definition, don't pay more than those prices. And even if you went high definition with prints next day or day turnaround, it shouldn't be more than £25 per roll. Also, some places do not process black and white film, so make sure you check online or check with them before you bring your roll in. I think I've covered the vast majority of the technical stuff. Now we're just gonna move on to a little bit of like thoughts on editing and just some questions, like answering any questions that people had. So when the digital prints arrive in my WeTransfer, I do tend to edit them. I know that a lot of the labs themselves actually put an edit on the photos because they like to up the brightness and the contrast and just make them a bit more like poppy. Whereas I then tend to go in and kind of turn that down slightly. I tend to reduce the contrast and reduce the greens slightly in the photo. Um, but that's basically it. I just use the Lightroom app or my Lightroom on my desktop. But yeah, I don't like to edit them too much. I used to put like big filters and things on my photos and now I'm like, it just feels a bit weird. It's not really my, not really my thing. Basically, I just try and bring out the best of the photo. I really don't do too much at all to them. I just want them to feel like mine. So I actually have a few Lightroom presets I built recently for film photos. Let me know if you'd actually like them because I'd be more than happy to release them uh, digitally as like a download so you could then put, apply them to your film photos as well and get that kind of dreamier look. And if I do happen to make it, in the future and you're finding this video like a year down the line, check the description. I might have actually made them and <laughs> like linked them. And now finally to some tips and just general thoughts on shooting film. I would say the main tip I have is to make peace with the fact that they're not all gonna come out great at the beginning. I only ended up with about 10 good photos per roll on the first few, especially with my contacts because on, your, on my contacts I adjust the aperture as well, which is a whole thing. Um, it's definitely not as point and shoot as point and shoot should be. That's like partially manual. And as I was learning how to do that, my God, <laughs> there were some corkers. But you will improve the more photos you take. So please don't stress. You're probably gonna be fine, to be honest. But just, you know, as you get used to like the fact that the viewfinder doesn't actually correlate to exactly what you're seeing through the camera and stuff like that. It's just more of a guideline. As you adjust to your personal camera and how it works, the photos will, they, they'll be better. But yeah, it just does take a little while and you just have to make peace with the fact that it's not gonna be perfect. Another thing I'd say is don't invest in a camera that you wouldn't feel comfortable taking out with you on trips. So I got this Contax that I love, love dearly, but I will not take it out if I think I'm gonna be drinking, if it's gonna be a big evening or a trip away or a festival. If I think it's gonna be a bit raucous or busy or I think I might lose it, I, I'm not bringing it. I have a cheaper camera for that. The AF-10 comes with me everywhere. <laughs> that is my ride or die. He's seen a lot. So I got a lot of questions about how to not worry too much about your photos being perfect, how to make peace with the fact that they might not turn out great and that you might not be getting value for money. With film, I try to think more about capturing moments. So I'll bring my film camera with me to a lot of places and then maybe something will strike me or I'll feel a certain way and I'll get my camera out and take a photo to remember that feeling. So I might be on a really beautiful walk and the light is just gorgeous and suddenly I'm like, yeah, film out, take take a photo. And I, I find that when I think about it like that, I feel a lot more emotion towards what I'm, when, when I receive the photos back and everything feels valuable on some level. Or for example, I'm having a really nice meal with friends, I get my camera out, take a few photos, 
even if people's eyes are closed and they've got red eye, it just doesn't really matter because I enjoyed myself and they enjoyed themselves and we caught this gorgeous moment together on camera. So on that note, it means that my roles tend to be a mix of people photos and then also some kind of worky photos. So I try and get photos of my outfits of like, you know, things I've worn or, or skincare or whatever that makes me feel good or I'm enjoying at that time. And then also just these moments like I'm on the train and there's, you know, this gorgeous rainbow, you know, I'll try and take a photo of that because I just want to capture these these gorgeous moments of life, these moments of life that were beautiful regardless, I wanna capture them in a still format if I can. So for example, a few years ago, I took my camera to my cousin's wedding and I got this great photo of my family dancing, my dad's in there, my sister's in there. It is not objectively a good photo, but it makes me laugh every time I look at it. I just think it's like really sweet and I'm so glad I have it now. Yeah, it's it's the evoking a mood that you're capturing and I think there's a beauty in that itself. Oh yeah, loads of people ask how to avoid red eye. I actually never get red eye in any of my photos and I think it might be because the developers put a little thing on it or like remove the red eye for me, but I'm not sure, but don't stress too much about it. I think it might happen when the developers um, process the films, they might remove it, but I've never had an issue with it. Oh, a more practical tip, don't take mirror photos in low light. Your flash will wipe everything out in the shot. If you really are gonna take a mirror photo, you're insisting on it, hold your camera really far away from everyone's face in the photo. I would hold it up and out and then point it down at where you are and just hope for the best. Otherwise the flash will just obscure everything. And finally, if you wanna get a bit more experimental but you're not really ready to dip your toe into other analog cameras, I would consider buying some expired film or just experimenting more with your film. So when film expires, it does fun, funky things. I've only used two rolls of expired film, but I'm planning on buying some more. It's also often a lot cheaper, obviously, because it went out of date in 2006. But yeah, you can get some really interesting results with your color and with like, uh, well, almost it's like light leaks and patches and stuff like that. It can be really interesting. So. Yeah, if you're looking to be a bit more experimental after you've kind of got the hang of things, I would definitely consider uh, buying some like old expired film on eBay. I used an expired film roll on my first ever roll of film <laughs> and it just came out like red and, no, it just came out like yellow and blue and green. It was just like so garish. I think that's everything. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope it helps. And do let me know if you start taking film photos. Maybe I'll create like a hashtag or something so you can share them and I'll be able to see them. I'll leave it in the description if I end up making a hashtag. But I'd love to see your photos. So pop over to Instagram and tag me in them or whatever if you do end up starting. Yeah, and as per, please subscribe if you're new around here and like the video if you enjoyed it. It really helps me, boosts me in the algorithm and makes me feel good. I will see you in my next video. Ooh, I'm only halfway through my coffee. I've got to neck this, I've got to go. Okay, bye.